morning. Thank you for braving the weather. And uh, again, uh, just uh, play it smart these days, folks. So your generation shouldn't be out and about, but you're the ones that are. So, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, let's pray for folks as uh, we still deal with cold weather, but I think a little bit of a warm-up is a coming. Yeah, that's good. All right, I'd like to explain before we get started, and uh, word and worship here, fresh wind worship, or kind of what's going on up here. Uh, this is my friend Mike, Mike Papentine, but it's spelled Papentian, or did I say it wrong? Oh, okay, I got it right. So Mike has been coming for several years, and his wife Carol, to fresh wind, found out that he's a percussionist. They actually play in a band together. So uh, maybe that will happen someday. And uh, so uh, Mike is a retired uh, pilot, both military and private, correct? Commercial, yes. So uh, the guy knows what he's doing. He's good at, he's good at gadgets, and he's also a percussionist. So uh, uh, thankful to have uh, Mike here uh, this morning in playing. So, and the reason we have this set up is because we're in part two of a series that uh, Chaplain Mark is bringing. Do you remember the name of it? I know it's been a couple Sundays. Old Time Religion. So uh, in the vein of that, we thought we would go old school instruments. So what year was your drum kit made? Nineteen sixty-two. Okay, I have a so nineteen sixty-two. I would have been minus two years old. A Fender Silverface, nineteen seventy-six. So I would have been fourteen. And then I have the best wife in the world. You want to know why? Because uh, for my sixtieth birthday, which was a couple weeks ago, I got a nineteen fifty-two butterscotch blonde reissued Telecaster. I would have been minus twelve. So thank you, Martha. So that's what we're going to do to lead worship. We, we make a joyful noise, and uh, and we thought it would be uh, hopefully a good match. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. So long He the world that He gave us His Son to yield in His life and atone for sin and open. So despised by the world as a one. 
but uh, we're going we're gonna to do it again, only in a little different manner and present it in a little different way. Um, we always hope that as a choir, what we are able to do is to prepare you for the pastor's message. Mm. Um, so uh, we're going to try that really hard today. Um, it's a delivery system. It's part two of our old time religion. It goes kind of like this. A one, a two, a one, two, three. <laughs> Why do we ever use the word repentance? And so it just kind of stirred in me over these last, I don't know, three, three to six months. And I said it was kind of like that pressure cooker my mom used to use with that. Um, I don't even know what that thing is. I should have researched that, find out what that thing is on the top. 
But you know, it builds up pressure, and then that thing starts to wobble, and you think it's going to blow off. Well, that's kind of how this sermon series has been for me. It's just been heavy on my heart. And uh, we said that, you know, we live in a world where sometimes if we're not careful, we're really heavy on God's love and God's mercy and God's forgiveness. That's great. That's good news. But you know what? Sometimes we, we don't want to go to his holiness. We don't want to go to his justice. We don't want to talk about the fact that God is going to have to bring retribution someday because he's a just and holy God. I just keep that over there, Mark. Let's just talk about his love for a while. And so we talked about the bad news, and we said that the Bible really is a book about bad news and good news. If we could break the whole Bible down to those two points, it'd be bad news and good news. And we talked about the bad news last week. You know, I, I did a little bit of research on some of these famous evangelists through the years, and some of you might remember the name Billy Sunday. Anybody remember Billy Sunday? Who? Talk about a go-getter. That guy would stand on the piano or whatever he had to do. He was a former baseball player. He had all kinds of antics, and he'd slide into home plate on the platform. I'd probably try that this morning, but there's too much stuff up here. So. <laughs> but Billy Sunday was a famous evangelist, and he called people to accept the good news, but he wasn't shy about the bad news. And one of the things that he said here, I pulled out a couple quotes, he said, the reason you don't like the Bible, you old sinner, is because it knows all about you. One reason sin flourishes, he said, is that it's treated like a cream puff instead of a rattlesnake. Whoa. It just kind of says it like it is, huh? And so we, we've talked about the bad news. We're not just dusty. God didn't just have to send Jesus to dust us off. No, the Bible says that we're dead. Spiritually, We're lost. We can't be found unless we come to Jesus. We're guilty. We're helpless. We're enemies of God, the Bible says. We don't naturally seek Him. But the good news is, He seeks us. That's the good news we want to talk about this morning. Remember I used that analogy of having an incurable disease? If we had an incurable disease, if it started spreading across our nation... We'd be scared to death. And, and then one day the doctor would say, but I have a cure. We found a cure. And you know, if you have that incurable disease and you have a cure, I'd be really happy for you. That'd be good news. But you know what? If I had the disease and I needed a cure and here it comes, that would be great news. Why? Because it's me. You know, and that's what we said about the bad news. We have to look in the mirror if we're going to understand the bad news and recognize it's right there in the mirror. It's you and it's me. So the bad news is really bad. I hope we came away from there thinking the bad news is really bad because that's the way the Bible describes it. We talked about the rich man and Lazarus. Remember that? And uh, Jesus warned us uh, that there's two places. There's two destinations. There's two different people groups. There's heaven those who follow Jesus, there's hell. Those that have rejected his good news. And so we, we had this slide last week, and I think this is kind of what motivated me to do the bad news and the good news. Because if the bad news is not so bad, then the good news won't seem so good. Right? I mean, we have to understand, as the Bible teaches us, and I said last week, this isn't Mark saying it, I'm just simply repeating what God's already said. I'm just opening up this book and saying, Here's, here it is. And almost every passage I used last week was Jesus' words. Jesus saying it. And so I hope we understood that the bad news was really bad. But then there's good news. And this is the good news that we talked about as we introduced this, uh, this sermon series last uh, week. God loves us. God loves you and me so much that he went to great lengths to have that relationship restored. God didn't wish for us to be sinners. That's on us. He longs for us to have a relationship with him that's restored. He's always pursuing us. He's always pursuing lost people. And if you're lost this morning, he's pursuing you this morning. The Bible says he's not willing that anyone would perish, but all would come to repentance. And so we looked at these 23 words in Romans 6, 23. 
If we could just take one passage, one verse out of the Bible, this is it. This is the bad news, and this is the good news. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why does this passage stir me up? Because when I was a seven-year-old boy, living here in Cedar Falls, I would go to bed at night, after night, after night, and I would lay there, and I couldn't go to sleep. Why? Because I was starting to think about death. Every night I would lay in bed, and I would lay there contemplating death. And as I tell people, I was scared to death of death. And, and so it began to stir in me a need. My friend invited me to a little church here in town. I went there on Wednesday night. The, we did all kinds of games, got some candy bars, all those kind of things that you do. But then it was time to get serious, right? And uh, the gentleman got up front and he said, uh, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the bad news and the good news tonight. So he went to this passage right here. And he said, the wages of sin is death. And I thought in my mind, I'm never coming back here again. <laughs> because I'm already scared to death of death. Right? But he said, that's the bad news. He said, what I want to share with you tonight is the good news. You don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to be afraid to be separated from God forever. Because here's the good news. The free gift of God is eternal life simply following Jesus. He gave the gospel. And then he said, raise your little hand if you want to put your trust in Jesus. I raised my, raised my little seven-year-old hand. He took me and a couple other people back to the back of the church and I knelt, my, I knelt myself down there next to the pew and I acknowledged that I was a sinner. And I acknowledged that Jesus died for me. And that night I put my trust in Jesus and you know what happened? Something changed. I went to school the next day and I had a best friend and I couldn't wait to get to recess because I had to tell my best friend about Jesus. I was excited to share the gospel. I knew I was saved. I knew something was different. Now I wanted to live my life to please Him. And the best part of all, I never once feared death again. Now, I might lay in bed and think about other things, but the last thing on my mind is what's going to happen to me when I die, because I know, and I know, and I know. And you know what? I want all of us to have that same assurance this morning. So we're going to talk about the good news. So here's, here's how we launch into the good news. The, the bad news is all about you, all about me, but the good news, it's all about God. It's all about God. Remember we said last week that the bad news is about us. The wages, the payment for what for our sin, what we deserve, is what we've earned. We've earned it because we're all sinners. Um, we've all told a lie. We've all taken something that wasn't ours. We've all told a dirty little story. We've all done something that puts us in this category of sinner. And the payment that we deserve is... <laughs> death. Sin means to miss the mark or to fall short. We said that God's the standard of perfection, right? So we measure ourselves up against God. I talk to so many people and they say, well, I'm not as bad as my neighbor. Yeah, I get that. But how about in relationship to God? Can you measure up? Sin means that we fall short. We miss the mark of that perfect standard, which is God himself. And what's the payment then? Death. Separation, that we said Sin separates us from God. We looked at that chasm that's fixed, right, last week. When the rich man and Lazarus, there was a chasm that was fixed, and they couldn't go back and forth from one to the other. And the rich man was there because he didn't trust Jesus, not because he was rich. And he was in torment. You could see Abraham on the other side with God. So the wages of sin is death, but... Notice how big that word but is. I was gonna make I was gonna make a comment about a big but, but that's not probably appropriate. <laughs> but and that word's big for a reason, right? You know how I see that word as we split up the bad news and the good news? It's kinda of like when I was a little boy. And you'll recognize this as moms, or if, if you grew up with a mom like mine, or a wife like mine. <laughs> so you're traveling down the road, right? And all of a sudden they see something that's 
not right. There's danger, or we just missed the turn. And what is what is, what's a normal mom's reaction? They put out their arm, right, to hold the kids back, and then they hit the brakes. Why? Because there's danger ahead. Because we're about to switch directions. We're making a choice. That's what that word but is. God's putting out his arm and saying, we're going to turn a corner here. We're going to turn a corner here. Hold on. You heard the bad news. I don't want you to go through the windshield. We're going to turn a corner into the good news. That's what that word but is. That word but stops us. It begs for a change in direction. It demands a decision. And then we come to those next 13 words in, in Romans 6.23. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pull a couple words out of there and just think about that for a minute. Because this is great news. This is over the top fantastic news. The free gift. If we had any curable disease, which we do, spiritually speaking, we all have a disease that we can't fix. As hard as we might try, we can't fix it. It's called sin. And then all of a sudden, that pill comes out, right? But the pill is going to cost us a billion dollars. Anybody here have a billion dollars to pay to put down on a pill that's going to cure you? I don't think anybody in the room has that. That's the way it is spiritually. We have a disease. It's not curable, but there's a cure, and we can't afford it. But somebody can. We can't pay for it. We can't earn it. But here's a gift. And all we have to do is humbly go to the pharmacy, and we have to get the pill and tell them, thank you. The pill's paid for it. But then we take that pill home, right? And we set it on our counter. And we step back and we decide, am I going to take that pill or not? Am I going to accept that free gift? Am I going to take that for myself? Am I going to drink that down and be cured or no? It's a free gift. You know, some of these infomercials that you watch on TV, uh, get your free gift. All you pay for is shipping and handling. Well, that doesn't make it free, right? And sometimes I think that's how we approach Christianity. Get this free gift. I'll take Jesus, but I'm going to go work for it, okay? I'm going to be really good. It's Jesus plus, no? It's a free gift. And it's a remarkable free gift. But we have the pill there, and we have to decide, am I going to take it or not? It's a gift. Is free. That's marvelous. Well, what is the what is the gift? Eternal life. What does that mean? To have eternal life. It means we're alive spiritually now. As I said, when I trusted Jesus, something the light bulb came on, you know, the blinders came off. Now things were different. Instead of living in a world that was black and white and had all kinds of irrational fears, now it was full color. And I wanted others to know that. We can relate to God in a different way. When we read the Bible, it's like, oh, I never heard that before. That never made any sense to me before. Now we do. Because we have this spiritual life that's come into our soul. We have this peace and this joy that we didn't have before. And it goes deep. There's no more fear. There's no more guilt. There's no more condemnation. There's confidence. It's replaced by confidence. We know for sure that God's going to keep his word. He's going to give us eternal life. You know, how do I look at death now? Because I've read the Bible and God's kind of opened my eyes. I don't need to fear death. I mean, I've never experienced it, but i watched other people experience it. But you know how I look at death now? And I think this gives me lots of comfort with the way the Bible says. The Bible calls death sleep. Anybody here scared to death to go to bed last night? No. We go to bed, we lay our head on the pillow, eight hours pass, we open up our eye, woo, it's a new day. 
That's death for a Christian. That's death for us if we trust Jesus. That's eternal life. We just close our eyes here, and when we open them up, boom, there it is. Our heavenly home. Well, how do we get that? In Christ Jesus, our Lord. The price was paid. The sacrifice was made. He died in our place. And he gave us a billion dollar bill and said, here, just accept it. It's a gift. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 and 9, I'm going to read this because it's a powerful passage. Romans 5, 8 and 9, if I can get there, let it mark. Notice what the Apostle Paul said about this marvelous gift. He said, but God showed his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. Much more than then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Well, we were still sinners. He didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up because he knew we couldn't. He came and he died for us. The price was paid. It was adequate. It was enough. As I think about that concept and how hard that is to understand that kind of love, here's how I think about it. So I have three boys, right? Let's say I went to the state penitentiary and there was somebody on death row and they were waiting for the electrical, electric chair. And I felt sorry for them. I had compassion. I had empathy. And I wanted to show them mercy. And so I said, okay, which one of you three boys am I going to pick? And so I picked one of my boys and I said, you know what? Oops. I told you there wasn't room on stage. <laughs> um, so I pick one of my boys and I say, here's the deal. You're going to go to the electric chair and that person that deserves it is going to go free. That's insane, you would say. That's, that's insane, right? Why would you give your son who's done absolutely nothing wrong for that person that deserves the electric chair? That's insane. That's what God did. That's what he did through Jesus. The one who was not guilty took on the guilt and the punishment for us. And so I want to read a story as we turn the corner to wrap up here this morning. It's a story about Philip, the evangelist. He met a eunuch who was coming back from worship. Now, it was a 1,200 mile from where the eunuch lived to Jerusalem. He was on the way and he was mulling over what he had learned from Isaiah 53. He was an important official. Uh, eunuchs weren't allowed in the full engagement of worship, so I'm sure he heard this truth, but he wasn't able to engage and give his answers, but he was hungry to hear and to know what this passage that he was reading from the Old Testament book of Isaiah meant. And so notice what happened as God directed Philip to come alongside of him and to share the truth. It says in Acts 8, verse 26, But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and went. He went there, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he came to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go up and join the chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how could I? Unless somebody gives me a little help or some guidance. And he invited Philip to come up um, and all with him. Now, the passage of scripture which he was reading was this, and it was talking about Isaiah 53. It's all about Jesus and what he would come and accomplish. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before it shears is silent so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation for this for, who will relate this generation for this life is removed from the earth? The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? Now notice this. This is the best part. Now Philip opened his mouth and beginning from scripture. He preached Jesus to him. He just shared the good news. And now notice the result. It's God stirring in this Ethiopian unit. 
As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip, as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him. Here's the key. But he went on his way, what? Rejoicing. He got his answers. How does that work? Well, God's Spirit was working in the situation, right? God's Spirit had to direct Philip to this um, eunuch. He was drawing, convicting this lost person. He was questioning, he was searching. And then Philip explained from the scriptures who Jesus really is. And then there was a switch. Instead of questioning, he went to rejoicing. Instead of fearing death, I went to rejoicing because I have eternal life. You know, in the first century, when they made a decision for Jesus, they would just hear the good news and they'd stand up and say, Jesus is Lord. And then they would baptize him as a sign of their faith. As a symbol that God had just done something miraculous. As a sign that this person is different. Jesus is Lord. A public declaration of their faith. Look at what Romans 9, or 10, 9 and 10 says. Paul says this. He says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's, for it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Did you notice that part? If we openly declare Jesus is Lord, if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, it says you will be saved. That's a promise God makes. But why the public declaration? Why, why do we have to confess him openly in front of people? Because we overcome pride, and it humbles us to do that. I can't do anything about my salvation. I'm telling you that right here. I have to trust in Jesus. We're accountable before others. It shows that we're all in with him. And that's really what a believer's baptism is about. You just confess your faith and you show others that you're serious. And it's a visual representation of what God's done in our heart. So there's good news. He didn't leave us wandering away, lost in our own uh, sinful condition. No, he sent Jesus to pursue us and to die for us. So someday there will be a final exam. And God's going to ask us this question when we stand on that shore. Why should I let you in to my heaven? And you know what? It's a multiple choice question or answer. It's a pass or fail. Here's the two options. We can tell him, God... I've done enough. I'm good enough. Were you taking notes? I was a good person. I did a lot of great things. The second answer is, God has done enough. God's done enough. That takes me out of the equation, doesn't it? Either we're going to stand on the shore and say, I've done enough, or we're going to stand on the shore and say, God, you did it all. Remember last week, I gave that passage in Matthew 7, when Jesus uh, had those people come to him and said, Lord, Lord, shouldn't, you, shouldn't uh, uh, you let me into heaven because I've done so many good things, I've cast out demons, I've done miracles, and Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. That's a scary message. There's no scales in heaven that measure out our good and bad works. We can't try hard enough or be sincere enough. Jesus did it all. And the good news is really all about God. So what do we do? How do we accept this gift? Here, it's as easy as this, A, B, C. First of all, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've fallen short. And then secondly, I believe that Jesus died for me. 
And then three, I confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's a choice. It's a choice. Remember Jesus in the Gospels, he always said, if you want to come to me, that word if, do you want to or not? Well, if you do, if you choose to, then here's the parameters. You need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and let's go. Come follow me. And that's the word repent in the scriptures. The word repent means to turn around. We're about to take a sharp right turn. God's arm comes out and says, hold on. We're going the wrong direction. It's a choice, and it's an act of our will. Notice 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow produces repentance, which leads to salvation. So it really is a choice. It comes down to deciding. And I want to close with this uh, video. And many of you recognize probably one of the greatest evangelists of our day. His name is Billy Graham. So in the vein of old-time religion, let's take a peek at this video from Billy Graham. Every single living has to make the same choice. It's either the world and its pleasures and its gods or it's Christ. Which is it for you? Oh yes, there's pleasure and sin for a short time, but it's soon over. The hangover comes. And there's nothing you can do about it. Choose Christ. And there'll never be a hangover except joy and peace. There's a lonely arena in the depths of your heart where the greatest battle of life must be fought alone. That's your decision about Christ. Your parents can't make it for you. The church can't make it for you. Your friends can't make it for you. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend can't make it for you. You have to make it yourself. And your decision tonight, yes or no, will decide where you'll be a hundred years from now. If you're not sure that you're ready to meet God, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, and you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, you come and make sure tonight. So as we end our service this morning, I want to bring it to a choice. You know, we make a lot of choices in life, don't we? I mean, we make a choice about a job. Have you ever had an employer offer you a job and you say, um... I'm just going to come and try it out, see if it works. No, it's a yes or a no. When I asked my wife to marry me, she didn't say, well, let's just try it for about 20 years and see if it works. <laughs> she said yes, but she could have said no. What school we're going to go to, we have to say yes or no. We even say yes or no to what we're going to eat for lunch. So a choice. We have to make choice. I think there's something powerful about making a choice for others to see. Then it's real. Then we know we're serious. Then our pride is set aside so that we can make a choice. So this morning, you got a little card on your chair. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand. But here's what I want you to do as a way of saying yes. If you haven't trusted Jesus, the Spirit of God stirring in your heart this morning. If you have questions, if you wonder if you don't have that assurance of heaven, because God gives us assurance of heaven. We know that we know that we know that we're going to be there. How can I explain that? I just do, because I trust God and I take Him at His word. So if you don't have that confidence this morning, if you'd like to put your faith in Jesus and make this the day that you have that confidence and assurance, there's a little card there. And that as I pray, as I close in prayer, I'm going to pray that little prayer. And you just pray that along with me. And then you can put your name on that card. There's pens in the back. And there's a little black basket. And there's a wicker basket back there. I want you to put your name on there. If you'd like a follow-up visit with a chaplain, check that box. Tear that top half off and put it in that uh, basket in the back. Not so that we have to know, but that you're making a public statement that I'm trusting Jesus today. And then take the bottom half, which has this passage that assures us that we declare Jesus and we trust him in our heart that we will be saved. Romans 10, 9 and 10. With the date, today's date on it, you put that in your Bible so you know this is the day. So when the enemy starts whispering in your ear like, you don't know, yes I do. You just talk right back to him because you have proof. This was the day you trusted Jesus. So, I invite you to make that decision this morning. It's the best decision you'll ever make. 
And uh, God gives us peace and confidence and hope when we step into that relationship with him. So let me pray. I'm going to pray this little prayer. You just pray that along with me if you want to trust Christ this morning. Father, we do thank you that you give us good news. I thank you for your word that clearly states that um, you loved us so much that you couldn't stop pursuing us. And you sent your one and only son to accomplish the work that it was going to take for us to have a forgiven relationship with you. We're so thankful for that. Hope that good news this morning is the best news we could ever hear. And God, I just pray for someone this morning that maybe doesn't have that assurance, that may be wondering or questioning whether they really know Jesus in a personal, saving way, or better yet, that he knows them. And so, Father, I just uh, pray this prayer this morning, and I pray that someone might pray this along uh, from their heart, trusting that Jesus truly did come and die for them. So, Heavenly Father, today I'm confessing my sin to you. I believe that Jesus died for me. He rose again to pay the price for my sins. I'm choosing to trust Jesus as my Savior and desire to live my life to please and follow him from this day forward. Thank you for giving me, for forgiving me and giving me the gift of eternal life as I trust in Jesus today. Thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen. Mark's usually a quiet, reserved fellow. But he's talking passionately about what Jesus has done for him and what he can do for you. Um, <laughs> a 52 reissue Telecaster is a nice thing to have. But far more valuable is the assurance in our hearts that we have the salvation. God offers to us in Jesus Christ. So come as you are. So let's find your name just as I am. Just as I am without one but that God was shed. Father, we just bow before you, so humbled and so grateful 
for the gift of eternal life. You didn't have to send your one and only son, but you knew that was the only way for us to be drawn back into that wonderful relationship with you that you desired all along. Thank you. Thank you for the hope that that brings to our heart and soul. God, we have good news to share, and I pray that as we go rejoicing this morning, that we go sharing that news to those around us that don't yet know. Thank you for the reminder this morning of your great love. Let's go rejoicing in that love today. Praising you in Jesus' name. Amen. Go rejoicing this morning. Thanks for being here. Have a great and good week.